Hi, everybody. It's good to see you guys. I'm Alicia Menendez. I am a host at MSNBC. I host a show called The Weekend. I also wrote a book called The Likeability Trap, where we talk about a lot of the challenges that we run into as leaders, uh, specifically around the question of communication, because to be a great leader, you need to know how to communicate effectively to others. Um, you also have to be very aware of how the way that you communicate affects uh, your leadership and how other people perceive you. I have a great group here with me today to talk about all of this and much more. I want to get right to it. We've got Craig Robinson. He's NBC. Senior Vice President of Human Resources, and so he Jun, leadership coach and Amazon best-selling author of The Inner Game, Secrets of High Achieving Women for Navigating Work, Life, and Mindset. And I got to say, Sohi, I've read a lot of these books. Your book is among the finest in terms of actually offering practical, usable advice. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to do it. I loved it. Um, we're going to go around. I'll remind everyone to unmute themselves. Craig, I'm going to start with you. A quick sort of 30 seconds. This is who I am and what I do. And then a, a little bit longer for a time when you faced a leadership challenge that really forced you to, to level up. Great. Well, good morning, everybody. So happy to be here. Thank you, Alicia. And so, so joyful to share the, share the, uh, the time with uh, Ashaki and with, with the doctor. Uh, I'm Craig Robinson, uh, as, as uh, Alicia said, and I am the head of corporate diversity for NBC Universal, a job that I have had the pleasure of filling for the past, I think we are coming up on, uh, on 13 years. In this role, I won't bore you with the, with the details. You can see it on the website but um, I work with our business leaders across the enterprise to, uh, to work to create an environment that is inclusive, that is equitable, um, and where people feel uh, supported, no matter what their backgrounds, and where we can come together to really be a first-in-class uh, content provider across news and entertainment. Um, the second part, uh, I think a challenging time as, as I think so many of, of you also are probably dealing with in your own lives and in your own roles. Certainly, um, the murder of George Floyd in 2020 uh, was a moment where I felt um, that it was, it was a real test, I think, of my leadership skills and of so many other leaders, because it was a time, and, and some of that emotion certainly remains when people uh, felt that tragedy so incredibly deeply and so emotionally. And as we know, it's very difficult to contain those feelings um, and not bring them to the workplace. And so I think that that, is, and, and people are looking for the workplace and their leaders um, and their colleagues to help them navigate through this difficult time, through that difficult time. Certainly recently, uh, the, the terrorist attack on Israel, on, on 10 7, the ongoing hostage situation and the, um, the ensuing uh, you know, humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Again, an issue that I think is touching people across the spectrum in different ways, but very, very deeply and is, has really made me have to think about how often we communicate with our employees and what we're communicating with our, with our employees. So I think that those are two very distinct times. And then I think that the third is that just the device of time in which we find ourselves in the world and how people have to find ways to work beside colleagues who may have very different views on a number of extremely, extremely personal issues. So I, I, again, I think everyone on this panel probably is experiencing that to some degree, but those are, those are the three things that I would probably um, uh, point to that were the most recent sort of challenges where I had to really sort of step up well, and as you were speaking, I was sort of shocked by just how quickly all of those things have happened. They are challenges that have happened in very close succession. Um, so he for you. Hi, Craig. I certainly, wow, you know, those were really big moments. Excited to be here. I am an executive coach who works specifically with female leaders at all levels to really help them step into their most authentic version of themselves as leaders. I'm also a global speaker 
and an author and an expert on women's workplace challenges, as well as an expert on the mindset. So the question being, and again, I related so much to what Craig was saying. Uh, for me, it it is in the times when I was leading teams. And I, I always say that leading is an honor because of the impact and the influence that we have on people's lives at work and outside of work. And in my corporate life, um, I've had the honor of leading teams. And the toughest transition for me that I can recall is when I made that transition from being a peer and a colleague to actually leading the team that I was, you know, friends with and peers with. And so those, those transitions can be really tricky in terms of, you know, who am I as a leader and how do I navigate relationships that looked very different before from being a peer and a colleague to now having to be, you know, a, in a different space that the relationships have to change as well. So I think that those are really um, that allowed me to uh, identify who I am as a leader, who I want to be, and what it looked like now to be in a different space with people that were friends and that I related to in a different way. I love that so much. And I think it is something we don't talk about enough, sort of what happens in a group dynamic when all of a sudden you you used to be lateral and now you are managing people you used to be lateral to. So let's make sure we come back to that point. Um, and then finally, Ashaki. Hello, be here. Um, I, so for the first question, in terms of my role, I actually am the head of HR for uh, the Telemundo network. And then I also have oversight for um, all of our employees and the businesses that are represented in the Latin America region. So that includes Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, and Colombia. Um, and in terms of my role, it, um, I oversee a team that that really partners with business leaders on all things HR. So from hiring to some of the tough stuff, which is um, terminations, employee relations. We do a lot around um, leadership development. So um, it pretty much runs the gamut of um, all things human resources. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, challenges that really forced me to level up, I would definitely have to point to COVID. Um, you know, that was a crisis that was um, totally unexpected. It certainly didn't come with a playbook. Um, and when we talk about, I think, Sohi, you mentioned the impact of the work that we do um, on lives. That was um, sort of took that to um, the next level from an HR perspective, because um, there was a lot of loss of life during that time. So, you know, that... Um, sort of uh, elevated the focus of our roles in terms of keeping employees safe, um, keeping the environment safe, et cetera. Um, so I think I, I, I naturally leaned into some of my leadership inclinations, which are um, leading from the heart space. So really bringing forward care and concern um, for people. I think um, creativity, we needed to, to move quickly and really support the business in being agile um, and making changes to um, what we do on air um, in a really rapid fire way and how um, do I bring forward the best of myself and my team um, under those circumstances as well. So I definitely um, felt like that was a challenge that um, really um, forced and facilitated me and the rest of my team to kind of show up um, in, in a different way and trust our gut a lot in terms of um, how we were responding to issues and information that was coming to us um, at, at a rapid fire pace. Trusting your gut is, yes. a, is a skill that is earned through a, a lot of experience and challenging times. I want to say, I have the pleasure of asking questions. If our audience wants to ask questions, there are already some great questions being submitted. Please just drop them in the chat there. And then when I am done with this panel of luminaries, um, we're gonna be joined by Susie Orman Financial Icon. So be sure to stay for that as well. The questions that were submitted in advance were so good. I'm gonna actually start with those. And you can. this can be to whomever wants it. This is from Sydney Lewis from the University of Missouri who asks, and I think this is a really smart question. In entry-level roles, how do you lead and persuade? 
how do you make sure you are taken seriously? Which I might argue are actually, so he kind of like two different things, right? Being taken seriously is not necessarily the same as leading in an entry level position. Yeah. So, you know, I think that there is, let's, let's be honest, there's a desire when you start your career to be taken seriously. And I think if we, you know, flip that story to how do I, how do I help in the ways that will be impactful to the team, to the client, to the customer, to whoever you're interfacing with, that makes all the difference. It takes a lot of pressure off to perform and it's about how can you be in service, which then allows you to think about what are the possibilities. And the other thing I'll say here is that everyone can lead, no matter if you have the title or not. And when we step into how we can lead, it really is about being in service. So that's how I would flip how we think about it. Anyone else want to take a crack at that? Sure, I, I could jump in to, um, to build on what Zoe said, because I think she hit it on the head um, just in terms of focusing on the contribution that you're making to the organization. Because I think um, when you're starting your career, it's also important to be patient and give yourself a beat to really ensure that you understand the context that you're working within. So when you join an organization, you know, asking good questions, um, meeting with people to learn about their roles and how the different pieces of the organization come together to create the context that you're working in. And then, of course, ensuring that you're really clear on the assignments that are being given to you and how um, and being diligent and consistent on executing against what what you're being given. Because I think if you give yourself the time to actually um, you know, accomplish all those things and build that foundation, then what you naturally find is that um, the organization will lean into you and start to give you broader projects and initiatives that um, that you can actually lead. So I, I would just say, be mindful of um, taking the time, doing the work, understanding the context, and then um, to Sohi's point, some of the, the leadership opportunities and the sort of plum projects, I guess, if you will, will, um, will find their way to you if you come in and it feels forced or you feel or or the team feels like um there's an entitlement that comes i think that that can actually backfire so you just want to be sure you do the foundational work and then that'll lend itself to the other pieces i just want to be really vulnerable for a second and say for me this is one of those uh do as i say not as i do pieces of advice because i was ungovernable in the early part of my career i would come in like a wrecking ball and i think part of it was i did not have faith that there were leaders around that saw what was happening that mm -hmm. saw subtext and one of the things that has been interesting to me as i have moved into middle management is is realizing the folks see a lot more than you think they see. They see who is first in the office. They see who is last out. They see who works efficiently. Mm -hmm. They see who's able to deliver, to your point, someone mm -hmm. who's able to deliver results, someone who's able to anticipate and get things done. Those mm -hmm. are the people then that you want to put on a stretch assignment. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that when you're out, you say, you lead the meeting because I have faith that you've got this. And then I think the onus really is then on us to create that space and those opportunities. Well, I, and I was, I, I, I wrote this down because Sydney, I am kind of in awe of you because what that's a, for, a, for a college student, what an impressive way to even put the question because you said lead and persuade. And I really wanna, I, I really wanna, uh, you know, focus on the persuade piece because I think that's what people don't often realize is that no matter early career, middle career, late career, you're always persuading and successful leaders are, are successful persuaders because no matter where you are in an organization, you need to have allies and colleagues who are gonna help champion what you think is important in the role. And if you're not a great team player, to use a cliche term, but if you're not seen as somebody who rallies, not necessarily consensus, but, for, but, but, but rallies some support, you can be the smartest person in the room. I think we've all been around the smartest person in the room who wasn't a successful leader because he or she was not a successful persuader. So I love the insights that you have, Sydney, because you're already halfway there. Yeah. Can I add to, I think a lot of this has to do with building EQ. And I have to say, Ashaki, mm -hmm. it's that time piece. It is really underrated now. I mean, give it a little bit of time 
um, let it marinate, you know, talk to the people. I want to echo that because it is so important. And Leisha, I love what you shared about, you know, you came in my terms, you came in hot, right? And I think there's something to that I have to say for females in particular, in terms of advocating for yourself mm -hmm. in the ways that demonstrate your ability. And I do have to acknowledge that females have to do that, um, unfortunately or fortunately, a little bit more in the workplace still. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to give you a little grace. <laughs> I, think, I, think it's, I think it is by gender. And I also think it's any person with a marginalized identity. We worry about mm -hmm. being hyper visible and we worry about mm -hmm. being invisible. And if you worry about being invisible, then sometimes you feel like you have to do a lot of telling when what I would say I learned retrospectively is I had to do the showing. I had to show up and, and do the work. There's a great question here from Zoe Grossman who asks, um, how do you discuss issues, sort of, Craig, to a lot of the context that you were setting up for us, discuss issues that may be sensitive to your team in an authentic and accurate way? Well, thank, thank you, Zoe. And, and that, I think, does harken back to, to what I said were some of the challenges that we're all facing in, in this very, very uh, charged time across, across so many topics. And we are still figuring it out. I'll be very honest with you because in some cases this is uh, this is a situation that is new, both in terms of what we're facing in the world and also the expectations of our colleagues and employees for the workplace to provide a forum and an environment where those discussions are having. That is not something that probably happened in corporate America 30 years ago, but we, that's an expectation now. We have to meet it because our employees are our, our family in that regard. So I'd say that while we're still we're still figuring it out, what we have done is created environments where people can come and feel comfortable learning and expressing and letting people know that we welcome people to come and to talk about what is on their mind and what is bothering them without fear of repercussion. And I think that the company can't decide to do that on a Thursday when they haven't been that kind of company on a Wednesday. But I'd like to say that long before I was in my role, um, NBC Universal and Comcast have, have established themselves. I mean, you can see this, don't, don't take my word for it. You take a look at the best places to work through the years. They are always both high on the list um, in terms of creating an environment where people think, okay, I'm not gonna be afraid to speak my truth. Respectfully, of course we ask, but I'm not going to be afraid to speak my truth. And I feel like the company is providing a forum where I can so that um, I can tell people what I'm thinking. And also I can hear what other people are thinking. You had me from the jump when you said we're still figuring it out. Oh. That I think is a part of like, I think at the beginning of my career, I felt like I had to always be like, no, I know the answer. <laughs> and there is actually something so much more persuasive and compelling about a leader, a leader who is willing to say, my thinking on this is still in process. Because what that signals to someone is there's still room for you to inform my thinking. Mm -hmm. I'm still collecting yeah. additional data. I want to, I, I, we have a lot to get to. I could talk about any of these questions <laughs> for a whole 30 minutes. Um, but there was a question here from Katie that I wanted to, to make sure we get to, because I think this is at the crux of this conversation, which is how you find the balance between being understanding and kind as a leader, but mm -hmm. not being taken advantage of. Yeah. I can start off and yeah, you know, I think both can exist and it is about in that. So I love what you said about kind of being transparent around, look, um, these are my expectations and doing it in a way that is clear and kind. And this is something that Brene Brown really talks about often, which is if we're clear about expectations, that's also kindness because then there's no, you don't have to guess. And so it is about, hey, I hear you. Tell me what your challenges are. Let's see how I can support you in removing them. And here's also the, the expectations of behavior or whatever is in that conversation to be clear about that as well. It's a yes and. Mm -hmm. If I could um, just build on that too, because I love what you said, Sohi, around clarity, around expectations. And I also think it comes into play when we talk about accountability. Um, so when you're clear to your point and kind and people have a clear sense, um, as a leader, there also needs to be a level of comfort with holding people accountable. And even in that process, when you have to have some really difficult conversations, there's still a way to do that in a way that um, is caring and um, empathetic and that a person can digest. It doesn't mean that the 
that the feedback, although it may be difficult, is watered down to the point where there's confusion. I think that that's really important because I sometimes think in our kindness, we can water the feedback down to the point where the person leaves so happy that you're like, okay, did the message, <laughs> did the message really get across? Yeah. But um, it's really important to to give the tough stuff, you know, give the the tough, honest feedback. And the person may not love it, but I do feel like if you're intentional about how you make them feel in the conversation, because you may be saying a number of things, but I often feel like people tap into how they feel when they're getting the feedback. I think mm. they can digest it um, in a way that allows them to step away and reflect on it, even if the message is, is one that's difficult um, for them to hear. I, can't yeah, I think you both you use, oh, I'm sorry, Lisa. <laughs> I, I think both of you refer to something that I, that I lean on too, and that is that um, setting the expectations for the conversation, because mm -hmm. It, it, I think it's perfectly acceptable, but sometimes not intuitive to say, okay, let's break this down a little bit, what we're talking about here. Here's what I'm going to tell you. So tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. Can we agree on this? And can we agree on that? Now, all that said, this other thing is not likely to change or is not going to change. And people actually appreciate that honesty sometimes because there's nothing more frustrating. I think we've all had bosses like this where they lead you to believe that, oh, that's great feedback, I'll get back to you. And they really are just trying to get out of a difficult conversation when really <laughs> then that, that's not giving the person the respect yes. for saying, I'm just going to be honest with you, that's not going to change, but here's what we can work on. So I think that that's where you can set up some of those guardrails, but still mm -hmm. be empathetic. Yeah. One of the best pieces of advice, I, you know, you, you all know that for, for women, the, the vast majority of feedback we get is critical subjective feedback, meaning people love to talk with us about the tenor of our voice, how we use our hands, how we sit in a chair, um, which robs us of people actually talking to us about hard skills. Putting that aside, it shows up in feedback sessions. And so I, I had a coach who said to me, and I thought this was great, that if someone's giving you a lot of critical subjective feedback, if they're like, you're, you're too assertive, you're not assertive enough, that one, you say, compared to whom? right, which gives them a chance to consider where their own bias may be factoring in, but also to say, and this is where I think this is valuable, whether you are the person receiving the feedback or giving the feedback, can you draw a line for me from the way you perceive my style to how it's impacting the results of my work? Mm. Because that way, you know, if I said to you, I know you pride yourself on, on being deliberate, but sometimes that shows up as indecision. Just two weeks ago, you were late getting a deck to the client because you couldn't decide on the font size. Mm -hmm. Well, now I'm connecting how you're showing up and how it's impacting the results. And I think it's important to remember if you are still at the point where you were receiving that feedback, you can ask for it too. Ask, how does it impact the results? I don't have a lot of time left with you. I want more time. Okay, um, <laughs> this is a, a final question, I guess, from Ochechi who asks, what are the common attributes, I'm gonna add, that you have witnessed of successful leaders, specifically in media, given that that is the community we're talking to? Who stands out? What is it that makes someone rise to the top in this industry, Craig? Well, when I take a look at, at some of our, thank you, Elisa, and, and, and thank, thank you, Ogechi. When I take a look at, and, and we have some of the, uh, not just by my opinion, by, by, by their success, some of the most successful leaders in media across a number of our platforms. And when I look at some of the things that they have in common, um, it is, in addition to many of the other qualities that we've spoken about, it's also an openness to bringing in people onto their team mm. who may have a very different perspective. Now, there has to be some commonality, of course, in terms of how you approach a business, but may have a different perspective than one's own in how the business can be grown. Because if people continue to bring in people that look just like them, are just like them, have the same educational, socioeconomic, ethnic, gender background, you kind of know what you're going to end up with. And very often, I should say, I, I, I don't, I don't want to overgeneralize, but certainly in a space where we are creating content for an increasingly diverse audience, every day it's more diverse. We, the only way to effectively do that is by having some people at the table who say, have we thought about this? Have we thought about this? I know no one here has had that experience, but a lot of my colleagues, excuse me, a lot of my friends and family are not seeing themselves represented with X. 
why don't we do this? I mean, this is, and this is when you see something that grabs people um, and people say, where did that come from? It came from someone sitting at a table and saying, let's tell a different story this time. And having an audience say, oh my God, you see me, you hear me. That looks like my family. I've never seen that before. So I think being open to bringing people in who don't think just like you. And we certainly have a full list of leaders who have done that effectively and the results speak for themselves. So, yeah, you know, I love, thank you for sharing that, Craig. Um, I ditto is what I'll say. And to build on that is to, um, I'm gonna put something out there, which is there are common attributes of successful leaders generally. And then, um, which look like being resilient, which look like being authentic and transparent, some of the things we already touched on. And then the piece around media, you know, I think because it is such a dynamic landscape, what I would say is the ability to read tea leaves. That is, look ahead, know the trends, and then, you know, having a perspective and a point of view and being able to execute around that is really critical to be a successful leader in media. Yeah. Fuck, you got the last minute, final thoughts. Okay, I would build on that and say um, creativity and how you approach um, problem solving. Um, for sure, I feel like in this industry, given that we are in a creative um, space and operating in creative landscape, I think those who can bring fresh lens and think about things um, differently and in additive ways certainly um, goes a long way. And then I think the big one um, always is collaboration is the collaborative piece. I think we talked about that, but I feel like in the uh, in, in the last, I would say just three to five years, we're finding that the lines across all of our teams have become more blurred. So those people or those leaders who are really open to collaborating, um, doing brainstorming, sharing information and ideas and not holding things close to the vest, um, I, I think are um, always rise um, to the top in terms of the people that we want role modeling for our organization. So we're um, competing, focusing more externally from a competition standpoint point versus um, competing internally. So those, those would be my ads. <laughs> Craig, you get 15 more seconds, but no, you were stealing it from Susie Orman. She's going to come for you. I'm sorry. I'm not going to add to all the wisdom that is shocking. No, this is nothing but a commercial. As a tell, first of all, thank you to, to Yvette Miley, her team for NBCU Academy for putting this yes. together. And also, yes. you students out there or anybody out there, if you are not watching The weekend on The weekend with Alicia, Michael Steele, and Simone Sanders, shame on you because you come away smarter you can tell they're having fun. That's what I like about this show and that they really like each other. But you if you need to be watching that show, it is time well spent, and particularly in today's world where it's so complicated. So that's the commercial I wanted to deliver. All right. Well, now that seems worth my while for what, <laughs> however mad Susie is going to be. Me. Craig, Chucky, Sophie, let's give a big round of applause. Thank you all Thank you. so Thank much. You, Thank you. Thank you. And now I get Thank to interview you. one of my favorite people, globally renowned financial icon, Susie Orman, a two-time Emmy Award winner named twice by Time as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. She has been spoofed four times on SNL. We're going to ask her which was her favorite. And get this, she was still a waitress when she was 30. Please welcome a one-of-a-kind global financial icon, Susie Orman. Susie, I was just talking now about you. on the Susie Orman Show. These are the top five money moves I never, ever want you to make. I know, my friends, I'm back here. <laughs> Susie Orman is best known for sharing the honest truth when it comes to money. The only way, everybody, to get over fears, right, is to take action. I'm now 70. I look good, don't I tied, but that's besides the point. I've been doing these since 2001. Here to talk about managing your wealth in this volatile environment is Susie Orman, personal finance expert and author of The Ultimate Retirement Guide for 50 Plus. Susie captivated the audience, over 400 women from 46 different countries. God, I love a good sizzle, and you do look good, Susie. We're going to talk about that on the other side when it's just you and me. You can tell me all your secrets. I was thinking of you, though, because I was at dinner, and someone was asking me about my earrings, and I was like, I remember Susie Orman being like, you know why I have money? You know how many pairs of earrings I have? One pair of earrings. You know where they are? They're in my ear. And I think about that 
all the time. Talk to me about the connection between financial stability, personal financial stability, and the ability to be a great leader. You know, to be a great leader, in my opinion, you have to come from a secure place. You have to come from a powerful place. And you have to come from a place of wanting to help others versus needing to pay your bills, needing to get out of debt, needing all of these things, because you have to be present in the moment when you're talking with your team, when you're on television, when you're doing anything. And the chances of you being able to really exude power when financially you don't know how you're going to pay your next month's rent or whatever it may be, really will affect the energy that exudes out of you, how people perceive you, because you cannot hide internal fear when it comes to finances. So top piece of advice for someone who is at the early part of their career and is trying to figure out this financial stability piece, understanding that they're more likely to have student loan debts. They are uh, very often times trying to help care for a family member, and they're doing all of that with less resources and with more pressure to save for retirement. Yeah, you know, it's you can come out of school with student loan debt. You can have credit card debt. You can have those things. But do you have a plan as to how is the best way for you to bring down your student loan debt? What is the best way for you to get rid of your credit card debt? What is your plan? And are you putting money towards that? And I know a lot of you may be saying, but I'm living paycheck to paycheck. There is no money. There is always extra money, whether it's $25 a month, whether it's whatever it is. Are you investing in the correct type of retirement plans for yourself? So for instance, if you're not making that much money, are you taking advantage of your Roth retirement accounts? But really it's, are you taking action towards eliminating that which is making you feel powerless? Or are you still going out to eat with everybody? Are you still going on vacation because you just work so hard? You feel you deserve that. Are you living above your means, but within your needs versus below your means, but within your needs? So what are you doing to help your situation so that you can become more financially powerful? It requires really being clear about your money, why, and what it is that you are working towards and, and understanding that. Can you tell me about a time, Susie, when your own leadership was challenged? Yeah, it's. I can tell you many times, right? All the way from being a waitress at making $400 a month from the age of 23 to 30 and, and the struggles I had there my struggles when I was first hired as a stockbroker for Merrill Lynch, being the number one, first, not number one, but the first woman in the Oakland office. And when they hired me, I was told that I belong, women belong barefoot and pregnant, but they would hire me, but they would fire me in six months. Obviously, they hired me to fill their women's quota. And here I wanted to be a leader in that area. I wanted to be the best financial advisor at Merrill Lynch. I wanted to overcome what everybody else had assumed would be my downfall. The fact that I was a woman and I didn't belong in that area. Well, after two years, I was their number six producing broker. So no matter what was put up against me in 1999, the nine steps to financial freedom had been the number one selling business book for 1998. It sold a million copies a month. But in 1999, when Business Week came out with the top selling 10 business books, not one book, including mine, by a woman was on there. So really, my whole life, I've been challenged by, nah, we don't need another finance offer who's a woman. Here I am, 10 New York Times bestselling books later. No matter what it was, because I came from a good intention, I knew what I wanted to be. I knew I wanted it to be the best of the best. I wasn't focused ever on how much money I was going to make. I didn't even care about that. I cared about serving the people. So I've had challenge after challenge in this industry. 
And I can tell you at this point, I don't have any more challenges. Well, I, what I find interesting about you, Susie, and where I think you are in, you're in so many ways, you're ahead of your time, but I think specifically sort of your, you are clairvoyant about diversifying your own professional portfolio. And by that, I mean, when you say this industry, I'm not entirely sure if you mean finance or media or publishing because you have done it all, right? Yes. And I think that that wasn't the way that people were thinking about a career in media 20 years ago. Today, it is much more common for people to be thinking, how do I play on multiple platforms to yeah. optimize the chance of my message reaching more people and of success? So here was the key to my success, which was money is something that affects everybody. It doesn't just belong to one race, one you know tax bracket, one religion, one sexuality. It affects everybody. So when I first started in media, yes, I was on CNBC that reached a certain kind of elite type of person who was interested in finance in a certain way. But I was also on QVC. I was on PBS. I wrote for Oprah magazine, but I also wrote for Costco, which I still do to this day. So I could go on and on, but I covered every aspect of the economic environment so that I would always have an audience from somewhere. And what ended up happening was I was number one in every one of those aspects. And so therefore, that made me a personal financial icon back then as well, that the whole world knew. I wasn't just here in the United States. I was also in China, India, Australia, you name it. I was there in South Africa. I was speaking to um, audiences of 4,000 people at a time that would sell out. So I made sure that I was universal in every aspect of the economic environment and the locality of the people. You understood that you needed to be global before people understood that you need to be global. If you see me looking down, it's because I'm reading the notes on my phone from students who submitted questions for you. And Susie, this one is from Bethany at KOMU8 News, University of Missouri. And she asks, what advice would you give your 20 year old self if you could go back in time? Yeah, if I had to go back in time, I wouldn't give my 20-year-old self any advice. And the reason is this. I firmly believe everything that happens in your life to you is meant to teach you something. And by the way, nothing will teach you a lesson more than your money. It is the great teacher of all time because it affects you on every level. So everything that has happened to me that has been negative or something that isn't what I wanted made me stronger. But if I had known where I was going to be today, if I had known this and that so I could avoid those things, I would not be the powerful woman that you see sitting in front of you right now. And also, if you were anything like me, your 20-year-old self wasn't willing to take advice. So uh -huh. it's good that you did not waste your energy trying to give it. Um, biggest mistake you've watched business leaders make over the years, most frequent, most common? Yeah. What fascinates me is that, as you know, I've been on almost every television show that's ever been created. And during the breaks or while we were back you know, stage or whatever, major personalities that you would think had all the money in the world would Susie, I may have, you may have glitched out for a second, but hopefully we are going to get you back because I want to both hear the uh, answer to this question. I also want to um, find out which of the many SNL um, parodies were your favorite. So if someone could let me know if we're going to be able to get um, Susie back up or if it's just my screen that's dropping. OK, good. Now, see, this was like the benefit of doing so much of this during the pandemic, which is five years ago. I think we all would have freaked out. But now we know Susie will be back and her Internet 
will be back. And um, not only does this happen now on Zooms and Hopins and StreamYards, it also happens sometimes when we are on live television and people are joining us from their cars uh, via phone. It also happens when people are joining us from their offices and their garages. So give it a few seconds. We're going to hear from Susie. There's so much to reflect on, both from that conversation with Craig and Ashaki and Sohi. I don't know if you felt the way I felt, like that conversation could have gone on, gone on a lot longer. I've got pages of questions I wanted to get to um, with all of them. And there were so many good questions that were submitted by you. So thank you for being my de facto producers and actually trying to get those in there. There's a good question here that hopefully when Susie comes back, I'm going to be able to ask. This is from Carlos Osuna Gill, who asks how you deal with a very good employee that feels he is underpaid. Um, that is something that I think a lot of managers deal with quite regularly. Um, I am going to check my phone to see if our producers are able to get Susie back. Welcome to live television and to live events. This is what it looks like. I hope it is as glamorous as you imagined it is. Um, they're trying to get her back. So I will sit with you while we do that. And I'll tell you about some of my favorite takeaways um, when I was writing the likability trap, which I think factors into a lot of these questions about leadership and about management. Um, the likability trap sort of a lie because I act as though there's only one when in reality there are several. Um, the ideas that, you know, um, that one, a what we expect of a woman, which is warmth and communality, is not what we expect of a leader. What we expect of a leader is someone who is assertive and can actually go to the mat. And so very often women, though I think this can happen to, to people of all genders, go through is sort of this idea that how they show up as themselves is not necessarily what people expect of a leader. I also think we're in this moment where there's this call for authenticity, um, that we want people to lead in a way that is authentic. That's something that we hear all the time. Um, when in reality, I think that is something that doesn't feel safe for everyone to do. If you're a person with a marginalized identity, sometimes it feels like you are, you know, being asked to, to take a risk. I think I have a shocky back with me, Susie, Susie, yes. we are still trying to get on, but I, I wonder if you heard me a shocky talking mm -hmm. about that, that, that the challenge of saying, Oh, be an authentic leader. Yes. Right. That like that, I think for some of us right. can feel a little bit like a dangerous dare where yes. if it lands, mm -hmm. great, great, and right. If it doesn't, you will be deemed not a fit. Exactly. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think shape shifting yourself um, for the benefit of others at the expense of yourself is never a good idea. Um, Alicia, it, 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 because people love you when you're giving them the answers and responses and reactions that they want. And then that uh, sentiment can change with the wind in terms of, um, you know, people not necessarily liking the authentic you. But I don't know that it's truly as personal as that. And it, 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 it um, is more about sometimes what people are trying to achieve and your role in that. So I, I certainly am one to, um, I've gotten more comfortable with wanting to be my authentic self and be respected versus um, necessarily having a desire to be liked per se. Um, because I think, you know, sitting behind respect is um, people feeling like you're knowledgeable, you know, you, you're great at your craft, you're trustworthy, et cetera. And I sort of feel like um, the sentiment of that is less flexible, like people typically either you get respected or you don't, um, versus with likability, I feel like sometimes um, that's based on what people are trying to achieve and whether they feel like you're standing in the way of that or um, supporting that. So the context is important, but I, I've opted for a little bit more around respect versus feeling like I need to be liked, because if you're generally a likable person, <laughs> I think you'll find um, your tribe. Well, well, and I think you're right also mm -hmm. that uh, to your point about like the place has to be created in a way that allows you to show up as being yes. authentic. Yes. Um, I, I think Susie may call me and I'm not sure how I'm gonna functionally okay. do that, but okay. we're all gonna be on this adventure together while I am waiting for yeah. that. Can you answer this question from Carlos about, it's actually a perfect HR question about how you mm -hmm. deal with a very good employee that feels that they're undercompensated? 
Oh, sure. Um, thank you for the question, Carlos. Um, yes, we actually, uh, that's what HR is here for. We will tend to um, have a sit down with the employee, get a sense for, um, you know, what data and information the employee is um, referencing. We typically feel very confident in um, our compensation structures because we do annual surveys, which is an opportunity for us to compare our compensation ranges to um, similarly situated employers. But that doesn't mean that we always get it right. So we're happy to sit with an employee um, and then do some additional assessment of where where they are and then come back. And there have been some times where we've made um, some adjustments to an employee's compensation based on their concern. And there are other times where um, we feel like we're spot on and we can um, share the context for why um, the person is sitting at the um, compensation that they're at. So that's typically how we would deal with that, Carlos, is um, you know always step forward and engage either your supervisor or your HR partner to have um, an open conversation about that. I am putting Susie Orman on speaker just in the craziest technical feat ever. Susie, say goodbye to everybody and, and give us one last word of wisdom. <laughs> Basically, I'm so sorry about that. They just cut electricity to the entire building. So I think somebody working in the street <laughs> cut everything. Anyway, the bottom line is this, is that I encourage all of you to be the best financial, personal financial leader in your own life, to come from a place of personal power when it comes to your money you will never be powerful in life until you're powerful over your own money how you think about it feel about it and invest it so just know every one of you can do that no matter what if i can do it you can do it so the last thing is make sure you all listen to women and money and everybody smart enough to listen because that's where you will learn what you need to know to make your money grow. Susie, what a thrill. Thank you so much for calling back in. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that, everybody. Bye. 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 And now I will have Susie Orman on personal speed dial. So what, what didn't work out for everybody else worked that. out for me. Um, Ashaki, thank you for jumping in and being my pinch hitter. And thank you to of all of you uh, for bearing with us. Uh, what a treat to have Susie Orman. Okay, we are going to take a quick 10-minute break. We are going to regroup at noon on the main stage so we can hear about NBC Universal's 2024 Paris Olympic coverage. We're going to see you there. Thanks, Alicia. Bye, everybody. Good luck to you all.